Hello, Nick Leifker here. I'm going to try to re-record the collaborate session for week six for GMGT 590, just to go over the basics of what was discussed and what was going on. So here we go. First of all, a little bit on what is discussed this week. There are a number of topics, and you'll note that we don't go very far into them. You know, we talk a little bit about MRP, ERP. We talk a little bit about lean production. You know, we talk a little bit about value stream mapping. And each of these subjects could easily take up their own course, and many cases do. That said, what I want you to take away is what these tools are, the very basics of how they work, and if you want to know more, if you need to know more in your, in, your, in your work, they are available and you can study them. It's just that with a course like this, there is only so much time. There are only so many topics that we can cover. And as such, some things we only discuss a little bit so that you know they're there and the tools are there if you need to research them. Now, with risk pooling, as with any decision, it's important to note that there are trade-offs, that when you make a decision, that there are likely some negative aspects to it as well as the positive. With risk pooling, what usually ends up being traded off, you usually end up trading off less need for inventory with the ability to serve a certain segment of your customer base. So it's important to note when it comes to risk pooling that at some point somebody thought it was a good idea to have each of these different locations, to have each of these different products. And as such, to go away from that means going away from those decisions, if you, in effect, reversing those decisions. We see examples of this with regard to location pooling, where we may combine several locations into one. However, to do so means that we bring ourselves further away from some of our customers, and they may have to travel a greater distance if they wish to shop at our location. In the same way with product pooling, if we consolidate these particular products into one, we may be moving out of particular markets, particular target markets, with this decision. Now, the example that came to mind when I saw this particular question in the, in the discussion forums was a real life example. The town I grew up in, had, it had a Walmart. In fact, that was the main store in the town. As a result, a good portion of the shopping that my family did as we were growing up was done in Walmart. Now, it's important to note that this was the 1980s. The Walmart that was in this town was probably about half the size of your average Wegmans. This was not a large Walmart. So... In the 1990s, when Walmart began to go to the superstore model, you know, having fewer stores but larger stores, they decided to close many of their older stores that were smaller than what they were to, what they're hoping to do. In effect, they were they were consolidating locations. So, my hometown lost its Walmart. Now, Walmart quite obviously got savings from this, and as several locations were consolidated into one. However, it also meant that people in my hometown, hometown had to go a longer distance if they wanted to go to Walmart. And as most decisions are, there were some side effects. First, moving away from the community meant that the community could and oftentimes would go to other locations. All of a sudden, it felt better to go to Target, for lack of a better way of putting it. 
Uh, another rather interesting bit that happened that maybe showed a lack of foresight. Closing this Walmart occurred only a couple of years before this particular town's population exploded due to urban sprawl. To give you an idea, my graduating class had about 300 people in it. When my younger sister graduated from the same high school four years later, the graduating class had almost doubled. This was a town that had encountered meteoric population growth. However, this was also a town that remembered when it lost its main store. So, about 10 years later, when Walmart wanted to go back into Allen, well, let's just say that there was some resistance. Now, eventually, they were allowed back in, but because they had left 10 years ago, there was some resistance to Walmart actually going back into this particular town. Now, for an example of a case where risk pooling probably had a positive effect, uh, well, there's a link here. Um, the nice little link in Wikipedia that shows the timeline of the various Macintosh models. What I want you to pay particular attention to is the area around 1998. In other words, the area about the time that Steve Jobs came back to Mac. All of a sudden, Apple went from well over a dozen products to about five. So suddenly, Apple had far fewer products that they needed to worry about. Moreover, by having these products, they were able to clearly define which part of the market these particular these particular products were targeting. When it comes to risk pooling and when to use it and what form to use, it's important to note that risk pooling is very much an opportunistic decision. We see moments where we can achieve savings by combining products. We see moments where we can achieve savings by combining locations. I guess when it comes to risk pooling, there are a few questions to consider. First, is there an opportunity to do so? Um, what are the costs? Uh, what are the benefits, of course? And are there any other alternatives that we could consider? For instance, suppose we have a chance to consolidate products. Well, the first thing is, what do we save in this? What do we save in terms of inventory costs? What do we save in terms of production costs? However, we also need to look at the costs involved in making this decision. What do we lose by consolidating these products? Are we going to lose access to a market by consolidation? Also, we want to look at perhaps, are there other alternatives? For instance, is it possible that we could have delayed differentiation rather than, rather than consolidating products? These are all questions that need to be asked when we find ourselves with the opportunity for product pool. When I saw the comment about realistic expect expectations on an ERP rollout, well, I couldn't help but laugh because there is a, well, there's definitely a cynic within me. And that cynic in me felt like saying it hasn't happened yet. The reason why is because there are always things that occur within an ERP rollout that are unanticipated. You're bringing a whole bunch of different computer systems together. There's always going to be some form of surprise. So when it comes to ERP rollouts, I'm always reminded of something that a professor told me a long time ago. Problems always occur at the interfaces. In other words, you may have one computer program here and another computer program over there, and they may work perfectly, and that's okay. But the real challenge is getting the two talking to each other working together and getting that working relationship together. So I think a better method of looking at an ERP rollout is instead of focusing on the parts of the rollout, focus on the connections between each of the parts of the rollout. In other words, the connections between each of the parts, each of the programs that are involved with this rollout. And by focusing on those and getting those right and viewing those as major goals, I think you'll have a better view of what in the ERP rollout it should be. Now, on creating a value stream map, you know, it's important to remember the steps here. First, 
you need to identify what's going on. You need to figure out what's going on. So you need to fill out each step in the process flow table. If need be, walk through, you know, staple yourself to an order. Walk through the process. See each step that this particular product goes through. That way you can see if there are any surprises. After all, with any pro with every process, let me clarify that, with every process, there are things that are sometimes not documented because, well, there's work to be done. And sometimes to get that work done, you have to do things that aren't a part of the manual. So once you've identified everything, it's time to map it out. You know, not just the flow of product through the process, but things like flows of information. You know, if you're sending orders every week, then that might be a problem. Maybe it's time to send orders every day. You know, you also want to look at flows into the process and flows out of the process toward the customer. It's not enough just to see where things are going, but you need to see where things are sitting and doing nothing. After all, that is what we're most concerned about when it comes to looking at a value stream map. Where are we having waste? So once you have your value stream map, it's time to search for ways to streamline the process, to take on those areas where the product is waiting around doing nothing. So can you eliminate steps? Can you combine them? You know, can you reduce raw, in, raw materials inventory by having the orders by having raw materials orders come in more frequently? Can you reduce the finished goods inventory by sending more frequent shipments to the customer? This is something that takes some time and practice. This is there's an art to this. There's an art to this. And as such, again, it's something that does take time and practice to do well. Now, with regard to lean production, the thing to remember about lean production is what it tries to do. It tries to eliminate inventory within the system by trying to eliminate variation within the system. This is any type of variation you can possibly imagine, from raw materials coming in to variation within the process itself, to the delivery of finished goods. Now, as for why lean production works, it's important to go back to an oldie but a goodie. You know, remember this from week three, time and queue formula. This formula is why lean works. You see, there's this nice little part of the formula where we have the coefficients of variation. Coefficients of variation of arrival, coefficients of variation of process. What happens if both of those coefficients of variation approach zero? Well, if they both approach zero, suddenly the time in Q approaches zero. And that's what makes lean production work. By eliminating the variation, you eliminate the fact that the product has to wait before being processed through a particular step. Okay, well, it's now officially time to get silly. You see, there, I saw that there was some confusion with regard to risk pooling and how it compares with what's done with regard to converting units within reorder point and safety stock. You see, the math is it's the same math. It's just taken from some different perspectives. To illustrate this, we have seven locations with this example. Each location has a mean demand, mean daily demand, each location has a, has a daily standard deviation. So you have seven locations. Each location has a mean demand of 50. Each location has a standard deviation of, of 10. So if we were to combine all seven locations into one consolidated location, what would be the daily mean demand and standard deviation of that combined location? Well, the means kind of obvious. 50 plus 50 plus 50 ad infinitum, or more to the point, 7 times 50 is equal to 350. So the daily demand for all combined for all seven locations would be 350 units. The calculation of the combined standard deviation, well, it's going to be each of those locations squared, the, the standard deviation squared, you sum those up and then take the square root. So the combined standard deviation will be the square root of 
10 squared plus 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 10 squared. So if we were to do the, do a little math here, that's 7 times 10 squared, the square root of 7 times 10 squared. So we take the 10 out of it, because the square root of 10 squared is, of course, 10. So 10 times the square root of 7. So about 26. Now, let's have a little fun. Suppose we decided to rename each of those seven locations. Rename them Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So, what would we do if we were converting daily demand from one location to weekly demand? Well, weekly mean demand would be 50 times 7, which is 350. Weekly standard deviation would be 10 times the square root of 7, which is equal to about 26.4. So, you notice a pattern here? Yep, there is a reason for that. There's a reason. Combining locations through time is about the same as combining locations through space with regards to the math. Now, I do need to make a clarification here, and that is that sometimes with these calculations, we make some assumptions. One of the big ones that we make is what's known as independence. In other words, the demand at one location, the demand at one time, the demand at one place, will not affect the demand at another time, the demand at another place. So, what happens if this is not true? Well, the full formal formula for the standard deviation, the combined standard deviation of two means, you know, if you add these means up, the full formula for the standard deviation of those two means is standard deviation of a squared, you know, the square root of all of this. So standard deviation of a squared plus the standard deviation of b squared plus two times the standard deviation of a times the standard deviation of b times this nice little thing called the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is this variable that defines the value between the relationship between a and b. Now, if you remember linear regression, it's that correlation coefficient. It's the same correlation coefficient that we see within linear regression. Now, this correlation coefficient is a number somewhere between negative 1 and 1. If it's negative, then that means that the higher a gets, the lower b is likely to get, and vice versa. Um, so, you know, a good way of thinking about this. You have two stores to choose from where you could go. You decide to go to one and then don't go to the other. Well, that's a negative correlation because you went to one store but didn't go to the other. If you'd gone to the other store, you probably wouldn't have gone to the first one. So that's what's meant by this negative correlation here, that if the results from one place are higher, the results from a second place are likely to be lower. A negative correlation will reduce the overall standard deviation and will increase the effectiveness of risk pooling. Suppose, on the other hand, though, we have the opposite, that the correlation is positive, that the higher A is, the higher B is likely to be. Good way of thinking about it. Suppose you have something that's dependent on the weather. It, ice cream. If it's a really hot day, sales of ice cream rise. If it's a cooler day, a much cooler day, sales of ice cream go down. That's a positive correlation because if you have two different locations that are selling ice cream, they're going to move up and down more or less synchronously. So as demand increases at one location, it'll increase at the other. Well, when you have positive correlation, it will decrease the effectiveness of risk pooling in cases like this. Okay, well, on to our examples. Um, we have a chain of children's stores, and they're geared towards science and learning. Now, we have three of these stores across the U.S. Now, the store locations, as well as weekly sales, you know, demand and standard deviation of a popular science kit that we sell, are listed here. 
By the way, can anyone tell me where the names for the three locations come from? It's always a good, good test to see what people know, I guess. Anyway, storing a science kit in inventory costs $10 per kit per year. We insist on a 90% service level. And if we need to order more kits, the lead time is one week with a standard deviation of lead time of 0.25 weeks. So given this, well, what should our safety stock be at each location? So how much safety stock is required? And more to the point, what's the cost of safety stock at each location? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what the z-value is. 90% service level, this implies a z-value of 1.28. Now, if we look at the good old chart on pages 437 and 438, we look up 0 0.9000 as a probability, we see that this corresponds to a z-value of 1.28. So, we have all of our ingredients for each of these cases. We have demand, we have a standard deviation of demand. We have, and the, this is in weeks, or weekly demand, standard deviation. We have lead time in weeks. We have standard deviation of lead time in weeks. So we don't need to have any unit conversion here. And we have our Z value. So it's time to put all of these into our safety stock formula. So for location alpha, safety stock required, Put it in the formula, you know, square root of lead time of 1 times 350 squared, which is standard deviation of demand squared, plus demand squared, 850 squared, times the standard deviation lead time squared, which is 0.25 squared. Add these two up, take the square root of all of it, multiply it by 1.28, we get a safety stock of about 525 kits. Now, we can also find the safety stocks for the other two locations. For beta, the safety stock is about 345 kits, and I think a little bit of explanation is deserved here. It is good practice to round up when it comes to safety stock, because if you want, because, you know, if, if you want at least 95%, or at least 90% in this case, you want to be above 345.06, so you would officially round up to 346. However, 345 in this case is close enough. It, this is one of those cases where if we ordered 345, our service level would probably be 89.95 or something along those lines. So in this case, you know, it's okay to round down. So for the safety stock of the other one, well, about 560 kits. So, we've calculated the safety stock that we need at each location. We can then use this safety stock for each location. Well, we, the thing about safety stock is it's inventory that's always going to be there, or more to the point, inventory that, on average, is always going to be there. It's that little extra that we keep in inventory to guard against the probability of not running out. We may have less than that sometimes, we may have greater than that sometimes, but on average, safety stock will be there. So the cost of safety stock at each location is just safety stock multiplied by the cost of item per year, the, co the holding cost per item per year. In this case, that total cost is just $14,300. Now, let's have a little fun here. We've decided to consolidate these stores by closing all of them down and replacing them with a warehouse and an online website. Now, because these science kits have such a following, we anticipate no loss of sales. So, if we combine all of these locations into one, what will be our new combined safety stock? And more to the point, how much money will we save Due to, due to consolidation in this case. The first thing we need to do is we need to calculate the combined demand and the combined standard deviation 
from all three locations. Combined weekly demand is fairly straightforward. You sum up the three mean demands for each location. So in this case, 850 plus 400 plus 700 is equal to 1,950 kits. Our combined standard deviation, well, we take the standard deviation from each location, square it, add it up, and then take the square root of all of it. So in this case, the square root of 350 squared plus 250 squared plus 400 squared comes out to about 587.37 kits. We have a new mean, not 1,950 kits per week. We have a new standard deviation of that demand. 587.37. Our lead time has not changed. It is still one week. Our standard deviation of lead time has not changed. It is still 0.25 weeks. Our Z value has not changed. It is still 1.28. Thus, we can find a new safety stock based on this new mean and standard deviation. We put the numbers into the formula and we find that we have a new safety stock of about 979 kits. If our new safety stock is 979 kits, then it'll cost us per year $9,790 per year to hold the safety stock in inventory. So, our savings from consolidating, well, that's going to be 14300 which is how much safety stock cost for all of the old ones, com old locations combined, minus 9,790, which is how much the combined location costs in terms of safety stock. We end up getting savings of about 4510 dollars. $4, Thus, by combining these locations, we save about $4,500 a year just on these particular kits. I had a real surprise when it came to this particular example when talking with the class in the Collaborate session because I made a change to this particular example in between semesters and the solution that I had written down was an example from one semester while the one that was given to y'all was from another. So I had to make some changes on the fly. At any rate, the changes are here and are available. We have three pharmacies, and each of these pharmacies, they have to keep a stock effects of phenidine available for customers. Now, the mean demand is 1,000 pills a day at each location, with a standard deviation of 200 pills per day at each location. Now, it takes three days for a shipment of pills to come, into the come in from the warehouse, and due to demand, each pharmacy has to have a service level of 90%. 90%. Now, given this, what's the safety stock at each location? And second, what's the reorder point at each location? Now, suppose we decide to pool all of these inventories into one location. What will be our new demand and standard deviation at the pooled location? What will be the safety stock? And what would be the reorder point? So let's have a summary of the data we have. We have a daily demand of 1,000 pills a day at each location. We have a standard deviation of demand of 200 pills a day at each location. We have a lead time of three days. There is no standard deviation of lead time. It will take three days whether we like it or not. And a 99% service level indicates a Z value of 2.33. Well, having no standard deviation of lead time makes your calculations a little easier. Our safety stock is just going to be 2.33 times 200 times the square root of 3. This gives us a safety stock of 806 pills at each location. Our reorder point? Well, our reorder point is going to be that safety stock plus demand during the lead time, mean demand during the lead time. Thus, 806 plus 3 times 1,000 equals 3,806 for a reorder point at each location. Having a, a safety stock of 806 at each location means that we are holding, in total, 2,418 pills in safety stock across all three locations.
What happens if we try to combine locations? Our daily demand will be the combined demand of all three locations, so 1,000 plus 1,000 plus 1,000 equals 3,000 pills a day. Our standard deviation of demand, we take the demand at each location, the standard deviation of demand at each location, square it, add it up, then take the square root of the whole thing. So the square root of 200 squared plus 200 squared plus 200 squared equals about 346.4 pills a day. We have a lead time of three days. That hasn't changed. We have a standard deviation of zero days. That hasn't changed, so no standard deviation. And our z-value is still 2.33. When we calculate the safety stock at the combined location, we use our standard deviation of demand at, for the combined location, 346.4. Multiply this by our z-value and by the square root of the lead time, what we find is that we have a safety stock of about 1,396 pills. Our reorder point based on this, 1,396 plus three times 3,000, you know, the demand for the combined location. So we have a reorder point of about 10,396. It's important to note something though. By combining locations, we've reduced our safety stock by over a thousand pills. So we've made a significant drop in the amount of safety stock we need. Our last example for the night. We have a computer company that sells laptops. Each year, this company puts out new versions of its four main models, A, B, C, and D. As it contracts with a supplier for these models, in other words, they don't make it themselves, they contract with suppliers to build them. The company will make one order for the computers and then sell that, those computers over the course of the year. So they have one order to take care of demand for the entire year. Each computer, on average, costs the company $750 to get. They then turn around and sell it for $1,250. Whatever doesn't sell at the end of the model year ends up being sold as refurbished for $500. Given this, given the mean demand for each model and standard deviation of demand for each model, how much of each computer should we order? And what is the expected profit from each computer? The first thing we need to do, find out the cost of overage and the cost of shortage. What's the cost to us? of ordering one too few, what's the cost to us of ordering one too many? The cost of overage, the cost of ordering one too many, well, we buy the computers for 750 and we get rid of them for 500. Thus, for each one we don't sell, we lose $250. So our cost of overage is $250. Cost of shortage, we buy the computers for $750 and sell them for $1,250. So if we're short, we're out $1,250 minus $750, we're out $500. We have our cost of overage, we have our cost of shortage. These are not going to change throughout the problem. Once we have the cost of overage and the cost of shortage, we can calculate a critical ratio. A critical ratio is, again, going to be Cost of shortage divided by cost of shortage plus cost of overage. So 500 divided by 500 plus 250 is equal to 0.667. What does this mean? It means that we need to order such that the probability of not running out is about 0.667. We want to be just a little higher if at all possible, but at, six, at 0.667, that's what we want. Next step, we look up 0.667 on our standard normal chart. We find that this corresponds to a z-value of 0.43. So when we calculate our optimal order amount for each item, we're going to calculate it as the mean demand plus the z-value times a standard deviation, with that z-value being this 0.43 that we've just figured out. So if we calculate our optimal order amount, we see that for model A, 
Well, 50,000 plus 30,000 times 0.43, this comes to about 62,920 for order B, for model B. 35,000 plus 16,000 times 0.43, this equals about 41,890. We calculate the optimal order amount for all four of our computer models. To find expected profit, the first thing we need to do is we need to find where we sit on the standard normal loss table. So the first thing we do is we look up the Z value of 0.43 on our standard normal loss table on pages 439 and 440, or if you're using Excel, there's a nice little function that I posted in one of the announcements. A Z value of 0.43, this corresponds to a normal loss of about 0.2203. So what does this mean? It means that the number of sales that we're going to lose by not having enough, the expected sales we're going to lose by not having enough, is about 0.22 times our standard deviation. And thus, using the standard deviation, as well as the, as well as the normal loss amount, we're able to find the expected loss sales for each model. So 30,000 multiplied by 0.22, this gives us a little over 6,600. 16,000 times 0.22, this gives us about 3,520. So we can calculate the expected loss sales for each of these models. From here, things start to roll downhill. From expected loss sales, we can calculate expected sales. We have demand. We have our mean demand. We have expected loss sales. Our expected sales are just going to be the mean demand minus the expected loss sales. In this case, we'll mean demand or mean expected sales for model A is going to be about 43,390. For model B, about 31,475. So we can calculate the expected sales for all of the models we have available. If we have expected sales and we have optimal order amount, the amount we ordered, we can find the expected leftover inventory. Expected leftover inventory is just going to be our order amount minus expected sales. For model A, we're going to have about 19,530 left over in, in inventory at the end of the year. For model B, we're going to have about 10,416 left over at the end of the year. Thus, we can find the expected leftover inventory for each of these models at the end of the year. So, we have expected sales. We have expected leftover inventory. From these, we can find our expected profit for each model. The expected amount that we expect to gain from each sale, we already calculated that. That's the cost of shortage. Cost of shortage, remember, it's what we lose by not being able to sell a particular item. By extension, it's also what we gain by selling an item. Cost of overage. This is what we lose by ordering one too many items. So we're going to have to calculate these. So our expected profit is going to be expected sales times cost of shortage minus expected leftover inventory times the cost of overage. We sum up the expected profit for each of these models, and we find that we have a total profit for, each of, for all of these models of about 52,033,500. Okay, let's have some fun here. Instead of these four models, instead of offering these four different computers separately, we decided to combine them into one universal model. Demand was independent, so we don't have to worry about issues with regard to correlation. Also, the universal demand will be the sum of all four in this case. Given this, what is our optimal order amount, and how much profit would we make? The first thing we need to do is find our combined mean and standard deviation. 
Well, the combined mean is going to be the sum of all four. So 50,000 plus 35,000 plus 42,000 plus 18,000 comes to 145,000. With the standard, combined standard deviation, we take the standard deviation of each location, we square it, we sum it up, and then we take the square root of that to find the combined standard deviation for all four locations. Thus, we find that if we combine all of these locations, we have a combined standard deviation of 40,460. The beauty of a problem with this is what has not changed. Cost of overage is still the cost of overage is still 250 in this case. The cost of shortage is still the cost of shortage and is still 500 in this case. As a result, the critical ratio is still 0.667. It has not changed. The Z value is still 0.43. It has not changed. We do, however, have to calculate a new optimal order amount. We have a new mean. We have a new standard deviation. So our new optimal order amount is our new mean, 145,000, plus our new standard deviation, 40,460, times our good old Z value, 0.43. We end up getting an optimal order amount of 162,398 computers. So this is the optimal order amount for the combined model. As mentioned before, our z value has not changed. This also means that the loss function has not changed. You know, LZ has not changed. It is still 0.2203. As a result, our expected loss sales is going to be our normal loss, 0.2203, multiplied by our new standard deviation, 40,460. We find that we have a new expected loss sales of 8,912 computers. We have expected loss sales. We have, of course, mean demand. We can find expected sales. Expected sales is just mean demand minus expected loss sales, so 145,000 minus 8,912 equals 136,088 computers. From here, we can also find the expected amount remaining in inventory at the end of all this. That expected amount in inventory is going to be the amount we order, you know, 162,000 and change, minus our expected sales of 136,088. As a result, we have about 26,300 computers that are we expect that we expect not to sell that we expect to have an inventory at the end of our time period if we have expected sales if we have expected leftover inventory and of course if we have cost of overage and cost of shortage we can find our total expected profit total expected profit again is going to be expected sales times cost of shortage minus the expected leftover inventory times the cost of overage. What we find when we calculate this is that our total expected profit is about 61 and a half million. Now, you'll note that by combining these computers into one model, we make over $9 million more in expected profit. At any rate, that is about all for today. Be well, take care. You've got some work to do. You, know, you have a project to get done next week. You have an exam coming up next week. Good luck.